Richard Madsen came to UCSD in 1978. He is now Distinguished Professor of Sociology Emeritus and Director of the UC Fudan Center for mm. Study of Contemporary China. In addition to teaching sociology, Madsen served as provost of Eleanor Roosevelt College for two years before he retired in 2015. Professor Madsen has done research on both Chinese and American society, focusing on politics, culture, and religion. He has authored or co-authored some 17 books. Please join me in welcoming now Professor Richard Madsen. Richard? Well, thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, thank you for having me and to the Emeriti Association, uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, let me say a few words to begin with about uh, civil society, and then I'll talk a little bit about China and religion and uh, try to pull it all together toward the end. Um, in the 1990s, uh, in the social sciences at least, uh, the idea of civil society was all the rage. By civil society, you know, what people mean is the whole realm of voluntary associations, uh, organizations, clubs, associations of all kinds, everything ranging from chambers of commerce to labor unions to uh, from, from churches to uh, uh, just, just, just clubs of friends who, who want to enjoy each other's company. Uh, to PTAs, to philanthropic associations and so forth. This whole realm of voluntary groups that stand between uh, the individual and the state. Uh, in the West, at least, uh, scholars became very interested in this because it was kind of the rebirth of civil societies in Eastern Europe uh, that basically uh, provided the uh, energy and the momentum uh, to undo communist rule in those countries and to begin uh, their own kind of movements toward uh, democracy. Uh, under communism, under in its heyday, uh, most parts of civil society were banned by the state. As these societies had gotten a little more complicated, uh, there began to we develop more free space for various kinds of organizations, associations, and so forth that we call civil society. And then in the end, uh, these helped undo uh, these communist regimes. Uh, in Poland, for example, there was a solidarity labor union, and then there was association connected with the Catholic Church. In uh, Eastern Germany, there was uh, the German uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church, in uh, places like Czechoslovakia and other parts of Eastern Europe, there are a whole variety of organizations, uh, even popular music associations, for example, uh, that became kind of nuclei of resistance to the governments and in the end uh, helped bring down uh, these communist regimes and then began this movement toward a democratic society. Uh, unfortunately, in many of these pla many places in the world, the promise of these democracies hasn't been fully realized, but that's a whole nother story. In any case, in China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party certainly didn't want to uh, have anything that would challenge its, uh, it, its power. Uh, but even the party came to realize in the 1990s as reforms began to take place in Chinese society, more market reforms and so forth, and the society becoming more complicated uh, including many more people coming and flocking to big cities and new industries being developed and the whole people being on the move, so to be more complicated. They realized that to, to manage society, you needed more kind of grassroots creativity and initiative and so forth. And um, to, to begin to solve some of the problems that inevitably cropped up in, their, in these circumstances. So there's beginning in the 90s, to be kind of an interest in the in even officials in China of exploring the development of civil society. So I went to China uh, in 1997 or so uh, with a delegation of uh, leading experts uh, from America on civil society and organizing civil society and regulating it and so forth and so on. And uh, 
I'm not a leading expert in civil society, but since I knew about China, they wanted someone to go along who could help them put the you know, Chinese society and culture into, into context. So we went to a whole bunch of places and we were well received, uh, but people didn't fully understand what the civil society stuff was, was all about. Um, uh, you know, it was like, uh, for one thing, they had three different words for civil society. Didn't even know how to translate the term at this point. Um, and, uh, 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 and they were curious, but everything was in very, very rudimentary kind of, kind of form. Uh, you can turn the next, next slide if, if you want. So, um, uh, th then, but then by the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, interest was developing even more as the society became more complicated and, and there was more felt need for uh, looking into further developments of civil society. And they're beginning to be developments, hundreds of thousands of new kinds of organizations, clubs, associations, and so forth. Uh, community organizations uh, were being established. So around, I don't know, 2003, 2004, I forget the exact date, uh, I got invited actually to give a talk to the uh, Shanghai uh, Political Consultative Congress, uh, which basically is it's an association under the Chinese regime which is basically like our Congress and every these, these have these people in there that get elected or selected to voice their opinions and they give speeches all the time and, and, and put forth uh, policy, uh, you know, proposals and pros of new laws and so forth. They do everything that our Congress does, talk an awful lot, uh, but they don't make any laws, okay? So it's all talk, no action. The Communist Party in the end makes whatever laws there are. But they just do a lot of talking, just like uh, our Congress people do. Anyway, so they they had me give a give a talk to them. I was the first foreigner uh, to uh, actually speak to them, and uh, so I gave this talk about civil society, and I, I did it in Chinese. And then afterward, uh, someone came up to me and said, "You know, I, I think I I missed I must have totally misunderstood you." And I oh maybe my Chinese not too good. He said, "No, what what you said I thought you said was." that in, like, in America, uh, you have all these different groups uh, pursuing their different interests and causes, and the government doesn't try to control them all, so they all work together. And you allow them to do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting any other group. And I said, that's exactly what I said. And she, she, she couldn't believe it, basically. She couldn't just process the idea, okay? So just this idea was not even wrong, but just unable to be, be processed within the kind of cultural horizon that she had. So that was sort of the state of civil society. Uh, people kind of interested, but just, just a very difficult time, even culturally, and not to mention politically for uh, figuring out what it was and what it should be and so forth. But Civil society then it it, it did uh, you know continue to develop and in uh, around two thousand eight or two thousand nine uh, I uh, also got invited by a friend of mine who had been on this delegation with me in the nineties uh, who was a lawyer who was one of the world's foremost legal authorities on uh, laws about philanthropy and so forth to go with him to the Ministry of Civil Affairs in China the central government to uh, talk to them about civil society, talk about developing regulations and so forth to encourage private philanthropy and, 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 and all that. And we had two days with these people and it was very, very good and they were very open and, and they had these draft regulations that they were, they were constructing and they all looked really good. Uh, except then just relieving, someone said to me, to us, he said, well, you know, this all looked really good. But you know, um, now we got to send this whole uh, proposal to the Ministry of Public Security, that is the police, and to the Communist Party Propaganda Department. And they're going to change the whole thing. Uh, so uh, basically, civil society meets the police state, and uh, uh, the police state is not interested in uh, having a, a you know an, an, an open view of of civil society, and. So what's ended up happening is that these groups that were 
being formed. So m most of them have been now in kind of incorporated into the state. Uh, people talk about NGOs, you know, non-government organizations, but also uh, more relevant in China are the gongos, government organized associations. And so th they've been taken over by the government, uh, controlled by the Communist Party, uh, and uh, and 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 kept in line. And and this process of trying to control, co-opt, and 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 dominate uh, what had been an incipient civil society in the early two thousands uh, is going forward even more now, especially uh, under the uh, regime of, of Xi Jinping in China. Uh, one thing that helped uh, spur this kind of movement toward more government control were what the Chinese call these color revolutions. Uh, these are the revolutions against authoritarian rule, especially in the, in the 2000s, including the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, 2004, uh, the uh, Sita Revolution in Lebanon later in the decade, the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia in, in early 2010s, and the, the um, Lotus Revolution in, in Egypt, uh, all these kind of groups, uh, which were movements against authoritarian governments, uh, scared the Chinese government. And um, there was a lot of talk about color revolutions. We've got to try to avoid these by all means, et cetera, et cetera. And avoiding them means basically trying to get more control over uh, civil society. So now, <clears throat> The story about civil society in China now is it's more and more constrained, more and more controlled, more and more absorbed into the state. So NGOs are basically these gongos now, government organized and so forth. But even in the middle of this, I think there is still a kind of realm of, of freedom for, for many people. They find ways to kind of subtly resist and, and subtly kind of turn the government control to their own ends and so forth. So it's not a pure top-down thing. And there's kind of a, a very interesting kind of, you know, give and take uh, from the grassroots. So um, maybe next slide. So now how does religion come in? Well, again, if you want to talk about kind of political science, political theory and so forth, uh, you got to recognize around the world Religion is part of civil society, religious organizations, churches, religious associations of all kinds. Uh, but in some ways, they can be very, very problematic to uh, creating a civil society that's harmonious and uh, especially one moving toward democratic uh, rule. Uh, they can be a tremendous help uh, in some circumstance, tremendous help because they generate a spirit of, of self-sacrifice and care and so forth and so on. But then the, the other side can be, of course, they develop zealotry and uh, 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 determination, one-sided to pursue certain kind of causes and so forth that can undo any kind of movement to, to democracy. And you see this in civil societies. You see this happening actually in the Middle East between different factions of, of, of Islam, for example. Uh, but you, you see it happening around the world. In fact, you see it happening in the United States now with uh, so-called cultural wars uh, being driven in part by, uh, uh, you know, religious enthusiasm on both sides connected with issues about sexuality and reproductive rights, family life and so forth and so on, which is, you know, shaking the foundations of uh, social harmony, but also, you know, democratic stability in this country. So religion can be a problem, but can it also be a solution to the problem? Now, how does China fit into this? Well, in China, you know, there's been a, a, a again, to the point of view of social scientists, Westerners, a really surprising uh, uh, religious revival in China. Uh, after being basically totally suppressed out of public view, at least uh, during the era of Mao Zedong uh, and, 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 and put down in all sorts of ways. Uh, most social scientists in the West, even religious figures in the West would have come to think that religion was finished in China, you know, as a secular society. But after these reforms began to take place after 1980, 
uh, what we've seen is a remarkable efflorescence of various kind, all kinds of religious life, uh, revival traditions, reinvention of traditions, creation of new forms of religious life and so forth. So it's quite amazing. So basically there are three or 400 million religious believers in China uh, measured by people who have had some formal affiliation with various kinds of religious groups. Uh, Christianity has been especially uh, uh, dynamic uh, from less the Protestant Christianity, especially evangelical Christianity, from less than a million uh, Christians before uh, Protestant Christians before 1949. Uh, now there is 60, 70 uh, million at least, if, and, and some people say more. Uh, so there's been ex exponential growth in the past generation. Uh, but there's been growth of all different kinds of religions Buddhism, Taoism, so forth and so on. Uh, so maybe three, four hundred million believers who officially or formally kind of associate with some sort of associate religious association. But then also, uh, one survey showed that if you count everyone who believes, you know, in the power of certain kinds of prayer, in 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 in, 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 in that there existence of ghosts and spirits and. Uh, that goes to temples to uh, on, on life cycle occasions and or prays for the, the dead relatives and so forth and so on. If you count all those people uh, having some sort of religious belief, then about 85% of people in China have some form of religious belief. And 85% is approximately the number that you have in the United States to say they believe in God. So there is all sorts of religion, both formal and informal in a place like China today. And the government is worried about it, worried about it because insofar as it forms a nuclei of various forms of civil society, they're afraid of social unrest and so forth. And then of course they have their, uh, the party has this fundamental kind of atheist, you know, presupposition and so forth and feels that religion has to be wiped out in the name of modernization. So the government is both hostile to religion, but then also realizes that they can't uh, simply wipe it out and have to some, somehow accommodate and so forth. So uh, the way they do that is to try to control whatever form of religion take place. So uh, for more organized forms, it's fairly simple. They're these so-called patriotic associations, uh, which control, for instance, the Catholic church and the Protestant church and, 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 and Muslims and so forth. And these are government organizations that are controlled through the so-called United Front Department of the uh, Communist Party and uh, keep religious life under tight uh, surveillance and, and control and uh, make sure that the leaders of these organizations are people loyal to the uh, Chinese government, et cetera, and also do what they can to sort of restrict the kind of um, uh, activities of, of religious figures and, and, and to control them. Uh, so one thing, for instance, they don't want Christians to do is to proselytize, to go out and try to make converts and so forth. And this is true for all the religions. So they try to contain it and control it, surveil it uh, and, and supervise it and so forth. So that's what they're trying to do with China. So it's basically taking a part of civil society and putting them under that tight control, making them gongos, uh, if, you will, if you will. And, uh, and, and keep them under control, try to keep them from getting out of controls from their point of view and um, uh, 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 try to direct them toward the service of the state. The process of trying to do this is, is heated up in the past five years. Uh, they have this new program announced by Xi Jinping of sinicization, making all religions truly Chinese, a Chinification of religion, even making Taoism, which is the Chinese you can get, Chinese, which basically means serving these causes of socialism and the communist party and so forth. So, um, but even within this, what's interesting, you know, for me, and maybe for you is the way in which people who have these kind of beliefs find ways to kind of work within the government control and to resist it and to turn it to their own purposes and so forth. So uh, uh, for now, I'll, I'll quickly just move ahead to some, uh, some slides that I have. Uh, 
to show you some examples of this, and then we can have some discussion afterwards. So uh, next slide. So there are different ways that this is done. So one way is to repurpose uh, state-sponsored religion. Okay, next slide. So here's an example, okay? So this is a, a village in, uh, in Northern China. <clears throat> this particular village was um, a, a, a site of very, very intense fighting during the Chinese Civil War when the communists were fighting well, earlier fighting the Japanese, but then later fighting the forces of the Nationalist Party. And um, so this was kind of what they called a revolutionary base area. And this, that, that tablet there is um, a monument to the revolutionary martyrs, the communist martyrs, and names of people who died in the uprisings against the Japanese and then, and then fighting against the Nationalists. Okay, next slide. Uh, and that building there is a kind of a, it's a museum to the revolutionary martyrs. It's very, you know, communist museum. Uh, but then there's those, those, those black tablets. The black tablets, what I'm interested in, the black tablets are, which has been put up, put up by, by the government uh, uh, office of, uh, of, of civil affairs. And what they are is, they commemorate the ancestor, an ancestor of people who supposedly live in this village. In that village, almost everyone is surnamed Lin. And uh, they claim that they, their descendants of this man who lived about, about 2,300 years ago, Lin Xiangru, uh, who was a famous kind of cultural hero in, 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 in Chinese culture. So they're all descendants of them, they think. And this is, and, and these black tablets are uh, represented the fact that uh, they they have this ancestry. Okay, next slide. So, now with the government, which is now promoting uh, uh, a certain first of all kinds of tourism, uh, but also kind of respect for the gl glorious Chinese tradition. Uh, they put up this museum called Temple, and this is in honor of Lin Changru. Lin Xiangru was a minister of uh, the state of Zhao during the so-called Warring States period, uh, about, about 300 uh, uh, BC. And, uh, and he was, children in, 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 in textbooks, they, they read about Lin Xiangru, okay, because he was a, um, a loyal Confucian. And he tried to organize the other Warring States uh, using Confucian principles, Confucian virtues, to help them defend themselves against uh, the state of Qin. Uh, Qin, basically led by the, who later became man and became the Emperor Qin. Uh, the Emperor Qin conquered all these states in the end. It, Lin Changru was a lost cause. Uh, uh, the Emperor Qin, of course, was the founder of China. China gets its name from the Emperor Qin. The Emperor Qin basically uh, was noted for a certain philosophy of real politique, uh, kind of raw power. And uh, uh, Lin Xiangru was someone who tried to, you know, do politics based on virtue, on Confucian virtue. So that was the idea. So uh, there are, and, and so the Chinese always celebrate these Confucians uh, who govern by, by virtue, even though in the end, I think, uh, raw power wins out, okay? The Emperor Qin conquered China, conquered Lin Changru and his people uh, and so forth. And then later subsequent emperors used a veneer of Confucian virtue to kind of, you know, solidify the rule. But in any case, uh, Lin Changru is a big, a big figure. Children read about him in their text, history textbooks. And the people here, this village, uh, think they, they have the burial mound of Lin Shangru, his tomb is where he was buried. And so there's this, this place where he's buried supposedly. And like I said, I, I wouldn't want to do DNA analysis or whatever's in there and so forth, but uh, they, they say he's buried here. And they have this kind of monument to him and so forth. So this is all 
government approved. And uh, it has been promoted in honor of what the government now they're calling uh, um, uh, intangible cultural heritage, the great heritage of the Chinese people, the virtues they want to be you know, cultivated and so forth and so on. And it's kind of a museum, supposedly. It's, it's all viewed as, as, as official museum. Okay, next slide. Uh, but you look in the museum, uh, you, this is this is Lin Chang Ru, this is his, his, his statue. It looks like a statue in a, in a temple. Uh, and then the next slide. Uh, then the, in the corner of this temple is this device. And this device you see in traditional temples in places like Taiwan and elsewhere, where they do spirit writing. So basically what, what you do is you have someone goes into kind of a seance and then his hand sort of shakes and there's a bed of sand here. And then uh, that needle writes characters in the sand. And that's the spirit of Lin Chang Ru from 2300 years ago, communicating to us, okay? So it's done through this spirit writing as like, like in a seance, in a trance. And so uh, this is supposed to be a, a, a museum uh, honoring cultural heritage supposed to be totally secular, organized ultimately by the Communist Party, by the, by the Chinese government. Uh, and yet off to the side, uh, people are worshiping Lin Chang Ru like he's a deity. And uh, they're using this method to, to, to communicate with him. So there's this kind of, um, the government calls it a museum. The people are calling it a temple and, and a religious site. Okay, okay next, next slide. Uh, okay, so that's one example of a state organization that's officially controlled by the state, defined a certain way, but the people are kind of turning it to their own purposes. Now, another kind of example are activities that are non-permitted by the state, are not are officially non-sanctioned, uh, uh, non-supported, but are tolerated because uh, the state doesn't think that they're likely to cause any trouble. So next slide. This is a temple in uh, the same area where, where this Linshan Ru village was. And uh, what this is a big temple. It has, 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 has like 24, uh, pavilions connected with it. It goes all, all up the side of this hill. Uh, and uh, it's partly tolerated because the people who constructed this temple uh, have been planting these evergreen trees all around. This area was barren ecologically in, in bad shape. And so they've helped kind of reforest the area. The government likes that. In the meantime, this temple. What this temple is, is, is all done on behalf of and honor of this woman. Next slide. Uh, this woman uh, has reputation of being a healer. Okay. Uh, she came to this village in the 1950s and she gained a reputation of being able to heal people. She lays hands on them. She does whatever she does. And um, uh, they get healed of all sorts of sickness. Uh, blind people get their sight re re restored, uh, people with illnesses of various kinds get cured, etc. She has this kind of healing power, uh, people think. And you're not going to read about this woman in the, you know, official media, the People's Daily or anything, uh, but her, her reputation is spread by word of mouth all around China. People come from very, very far away. And in fact, uh, and there's there something people were coming even from Australia, they heard about her. And you have some sickness that they can't cure, et cetera. They come see her, she lays hands on them, they get better, uh, they think. And I don't know, you know, if this is psychosomatic or whatever it is, but uh, that reputation is it works. And uh, she, um, and in, in, uh, in honor of her, in, in, in recompense, for her helping them, they've donated all this money to um, create this temple with all these deities and so forth. So this is totally 
non-approved by the government exactly. It's tolerated. She helps build, you know, plant uh, uh, trees and so forth in this ecologically damaged area. And uh, uh, has an enthusiastic following, even though it wouldn't be published in official media in any way. Uh, and people swear by her and think that she can heal them. And so the government is basically tolerating this. So this is a kind of civil society, a network of people who come together to get uh, healed and to, and, to, and, to, and to celebrate this, this woman who heals them. And the government doesn't really bother them because it doesn't seem to be causing any, any trouble, at least for now. Okay, next slide. Uh, another example. Uh, what this is, is an ancestor hall, okay? So uh, traditional Chinese religion, uh, a core part of it was ancestor worship. You worship your deceased ancestors. You believe their spirits are still alive and still there and there to help you and so forth. And uh, in this other region in China, <clears throat> rich people, successful people, uh, to, partly to demonstrate their success, are building these very, very fancy halls in honor of their ancestors, okay? And this is done by one of the richest men in this area. He became very famous. He was a Communist Party official, actually, who then helped uh, open up the, the area to uh, private enterprise. And the area truly prospered, and he made a lot, a lot of money in the process. So he's built this place for his ancestors. Now, it doesn't say ancestor temple on it. It says activity center. So this is a community center. And inside, there are badminton courts, courts and there are um, meeting rooms and all this kind of thing in this, this very, very fancy building. Uh, nothing to do with worship of ancestors. It's just a community center, uh, a nice community. But next slide. But if you go in the bottom of it, and it's like a crypt. These are uh, tablets to uh, the ancestors of this, this, this clan. And uh, there, there's, you see these pots of incense burning there. And these tablets are supposed to kind of uh, contain uh, the spirits of the ancestors. And these are the ancestors going back hundreds of years of this family. And, uh, and uh, they're worshiping them, they're burning incense to them and so forth and so on. And uh, they believe the spirits are there, et cetera. And this whole building is a temple for them, even though it's supposed to be an official uh, community center uh, and so forth. So once again, you have a certain government this activity is taking place. It's kind of uh, presents itself as, uh, you know, a, a kind of a secular community activity. Uh, but then, and it's not sanctioned by the state, but it's just both tolerated uh, and it's brought in business. It's, just, it's an amenity for the, for, the, for the village and the community. Uh, and yet it's, it's actually a form of religious life. Okay, N next slide. So uh, that, what I just was describing is what you could call them forms of traditional kind of folk religion in China, which now have made a comeback. So um, uh, let me say a few things about uh, Christianity, of course, which was imported through missionaries uh, from the 16th, 17th century on, especially 19th century by the imperialists. And, and now, especially Protestant Christianity has grown very rapidly. And the government is very concerned about this growth, trying to keep it under control. So next slide. This is a church, a, 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 it's a Protestant church uh, run by the uh, so-called uh, Three Self Movement, Three Auton Autonomies Movement, which is the Chinese Patriotic Association, again, run by the, uh, controlled by the United Front Department, the Communist Party, which keeps the Protestant church under control. So this is official, this church is officially affiliated with them. It's all, uh, Orthodox and and so forth and uh, supervised carefully by the government, but allowed to have its its various kinds of worship forms. Next slide. 
this is inside the church. You see, you see what it's like inside, uh, and uh, they have you know uh, extensive worship services and so forth on Sundays, and and it's, it's part of the official church. Aside from this, and much more dynamic actually, are these unofficial churches, house churches. Uh, which often don't meet in big buildings like this, but in smaller kinds of buildings, and 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 uh, worship in a way that hasn't been officially regulated and approved by the government. And the government's trying to control them and so forth. And you may see in the press, uh, you know, cases of pastors and congregants in some of these places being arrested and so forth. Uh, and uh, there's been increasing crackdowns on them in, in recent years. Uh, I don't have a, a slide about uh, one of these unapproved churches here. Uh, there's an issue of don't want to, you know, expose anybody. Uh, and, and anyway, I don't, I don't have any, but this is an official Protestant church. Okay, next slide. Catholic church, Catholics even more uh, a matter of concern for the Chinese government because the Catholics, of course, uh, are connected to, you know, the Vatican, the Pope, or, or global, and the government sees this as potentially um, threatening. And also they notice what happened in Poland when the, you know, Catholic Church helped the Solidarity Movement and brought down Polish uh, communist regime. So, <clears throat> Catholics are, are even more problematic than the, than, than the Protestants, although the Catholics haven't grown as much, and there's only maybe 10 million or so Catholics. But um, uh, next slide. And I'll show you a couple of Catholic things. This is a Catholic seminary in Shizhuang in the northern China. And uh, so this is would be controlled also by the Catholic Patriotic Association. Uh, make sure the curriculum is uh, properly uh, respectful of the aims of the Chinese state and so forth and so on, and, and that the priests are properly vetted. But even there, you have some problems. Of, of some years ago, uh, the government installed a new rector, a new, a new, new president of this seminary, and uh, the students revolted, went on a strike and so forth, and the government finally put it down. So even when they tried to get this under control, the control is nonetheless never 100% you know, stable. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> next slide, okay. Uh, this is a Catholic, uh, like, a, like a storefront uh, a chapel too for, for worship on, on, on on Sundays. Uh, next slide. But here's um, <clears throat> examples of a little more kind of resistance. Uh, this is a Catholic example. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the, that woman there uh, is a Catholic nun. Uh, and the other woman actually is a, a farming woman, a peasant woman who unfortunately has HIV AIDS. Next slide. Uh, so the situation in that place is um, uh, the woman who is ill with HIV AIDS uh, comes from a village in this area where um, all the women, when they went to give birth, they went to the local hospital. And according to the custom. Uh, in the whole process, they all got blood transfusions. And the blood in this hospital was uh, contaminated with uh, HIV. Okay? It's part of a massive screw up in the area. So all the women in the village practically all got HIV AIDS and so their children. And uh, so in many cases, their husbands. So the thing is a total mess. Uh, and uh, the nuns were trying to help them and uh, trying to um, provide some aid for them, uh, try to get some HIV, some AIDS medicine to them, uh, but also trying to help them economically. Uh, the people in the village, women are, are 
physically not very strong because of this, you know, the illness. And uh, the nuns helped them raise some goats, which are easier to raise than other kind of animals and uh, other things to try to help them and also give them some kind of psychological and spiritual counseling and so forth. Uh, but the local government kicked them out, uh, the nuns, didn't, didn't want them doing that. Uh, didn't want them doing that because uh, basically this mess up with the hospital so bad, it's such a loss of face, of, of prestige, that they don't want to admit it. They don't want anyone to know about it. And this is this kind of thing has been happening throughout Northern China, in fact, there's been big, big problems and maybe you've seen it about newspapers. So um, the government drove them out, do, 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 doesn't want anybody helping these, these people, doesn't want any, you know, the, 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 wants the situation totally covered up and so forth. So that's what the local officials are wanting. So the, that nun there in that picture was uh, setting up a kind of a center away from the village and the women have to take a bus to get there to give them in the name of Christian charity and so forth, some, some, some help. So they're not supposed to be doing that. They're not supposed to be doing that. This is, uh, you know, not approved. Uh, but they feel they need to do this because it's the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they're managing to, to, to get away with it, okay? So this is something they would, and, and those nuns would be officially affiliated, uh, you know, their religious order would be approved of by the Catholic Patriotic Association. They're not defying that per se, but they're doing activities within it, which wouldn't be officially approved by the uh, government minders of the, uh, you know, association. So next slide. Now this is about, this is another level of doing things just approved. These are underground Catholics, okay? So um, this is a village in which almost everyone in the village is Catholic. And they uh, accepted priests and carried out activities which are not part of the so-called Catholic Patriotic Association, okay? And, and so what they're doing is not legal. In the um, space next to this, this is a farmhouse, face next to it, they have field. They told me that they, they had built a church. They built it with their own hands, with their own money. Uh, wasn't sponsored by the government. And then the government came in and tore it down. Uh, the people there were extremely upset about this, as you can imagine. Okay. So next slide. Uh, here, here's a picture. It says, long live the Pope. Okay, I'm not supposed to say that, but there it is. That's a sim symbol of their particular kind of faith. Next slide. So what they've done is they've taken that building that like that farmhouse I said, and they've taken two far, two farmhouses actually put them sort of side by side, opened up a wall and made the farmhouse uh, a church, an unapproved church. So you see the pews and so forth. Next slide. And uh, there's the altar. Uh, next slide. And there's another <clears throat> farmhouse next to it, which they made into kind of a, you know, you know, a parish hall. And these are pictures of the various priests, uh, sort of unofficially approved, not not officially approved underground priests and so forth that have been sort of, you know, pastors of this place. Uh, and so there was in the Chinese Catholic Church this big split between those who accepted a certain amount of government control and the so-called underground. Uh, now, this has gotten more complicated because the Vatican has made some sort of provisional agreement with the Chinese government about promoting, about uh, appointing bishops and so forth. That's blurred some of the boundaries between the underground and above ground, forcing the underground to get more affiliated with the official patriotic association. But it hasn't happened fully, and it's, it's it's contentious, and it's a big issue in China these days. So, anyway, so there, there was a church. You see, people made their own church. They they had a building of their own, uh, which got torn down. Uh, they taken some farmhouses and made their own chapel out of it, and carried out their own worship. They brought in priests and so forth. 
uh, and uh, sometimes these priests get uh, put into uh, into jail because of doing this, etc. They told me there's one case in this area, this village, where this priest uh, got got sent off to jail. He was off there for for I forget how long a while. Then he came back. He got let out. And when he came back to this village, he said there are a thousand people in this village. They all lined up uh, and he, when he came back and knelt down before him, okay? Uh, because they you know, saw him as a hero for, for his particular kind of resistance. So this kind of thing is going, this is a kind of civil society, non-controlled, non-official by the government. Government's trying to get this thing more under control, uh, but the resources aren't fully there to fully contain this and this kind of thing is going on. Okay, next slide. So, uh, very, very quickly, uh, that's the issue of Chinese civil society and religion. And now there's this control and some kind of resistance. Uh, but uh, let, let me just end with uh, comparison with Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is a society in which there's been a very vital civil society in which, of course, there's a transition to democracy starting in the late 1980s. And uh, now it's, uh, it has a very liberal form of, of, of government, uh, very, very active civil society. Uh, and the, um, the problem they had actually was that as they made the transition to democracy, the civil society was so wild, so, so you know, so active that they threatened to kind of break the whole thing down. They're all every kind of group you can think of pushing this kind of cause, that kind of cause, that kind of interest, etc. Uh, uh, but one interesting factor in Taiwan was world religion in this. I, I wrote a book about this, and and basically, you have the rise of these religious groups, especially Buddhist groups that kind of preach compassion and care and so forth and have helped to sort of calm society down enough, uh, provide enough kind of civility uh, and caring uh, that some of the centrifugal forces of the civil society have been kind of mitigated, pulled together by more centripetal forces. And uh, Taiwan, even though it's, it's transitioned to democracy and everything has been rough, it's been a very successful transition and it's sort of held together. And one factor, not the only one, of course, is some of the religious groups. So next slide. Uh, one group I studied is a group called Siji, and, and, and they're, they're centered in this little temple in a remote part of Taiwan, although it's not so remote anymore, but used to be very remote, uh, Hualien. And uh, there's a, it's a kind of a convent of nuns uh, with about 100 uh, plus nuns in this convent. But uh, next slide. Uh, it's, it's, its leader is this woman there, there in the Master Chung Yan, who uh, basically uh, runs this convent, but then organize, has helped to organize and inspire uh, a huge group of lay volunteers. Uh, there are about 80,000 people who are so-called commissioners. And uh, the women wear these navy blue dresses like, like the woman there, she's a commissioner. And uh, they devote themselves enormous amount of their time and energy to helping the poor, the sick, the needy and so forth and so on. And then besides them, there are wider and wider <clears throat> circles of volunteers who help out when there are disasters and so forth. They go around the world helping victims of disasters. Uh, they also <clears throat> give medical care. Uh, they have a hospital, three hospitals in Taiwan, for example. They have medical clinics everywhere, including one in, in Los Angeles, in Alhambra, uh, a free clinic. Uh, and um, and, and so the whole point is to kind of cultivate yourself in Buddhist virtue by caring for others and helping others and so forth and so on. And uh, Master Zheng Yan there has, has inspired her. Next slide. You know, there, there I am and my wife and there's Master Zheng Yan. She'd been no, nominated for Nobel Peace Prize and so forth. She would deserve it if she got it. Next slide. Uh, and one thing that's been possible in that particular group, but that's not the only one in, in Taiwan, is because of civil society, enormous amount of, kind of innovation 
in this case, innovation with kind of religious spirit. So one example of this is their medical school and the hospital. Next slide, real quick. Uh, <clears throat> they've pioneered in their hospital medical school, uh, first of all, uh, based on Buddhist teachings and so forth, uh, hospice care, palliative care. Uh, they were the first group in Taiwan to do that for terminally ill patients and so forth. But give you a sense of what their spirit is. This is a room in their hospice and medical where it, 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 this room is where often the patients, you know, spend their last uh, hours before they pass away. And there's space there for family to come and be around, you know, the bed and everything. And they had this kind of cabinet. And so basically they're totally ecumenical. So it's this non, you know, sectarian, they're Buddhist, but if, if the person who's dying is a, is a Christian, so they open up this one side and you have pictures of Jesus and cross and everything. And, but if the person is a Buddhist, they open the other side and there's, there's pictures of the Bodhisattva and so forth. So it's, they got something for everybody. They don't care about people's faith. They care about them having kind of a, you know, a, a spiritual uh, encounter with the, the situation that they're in death. Next, next one. Uh, okay, another another quick slide is in the medical school. Another thing they pioneered, which is very big in Taiwan, is their uh, anatomy class. And, uh, and, and basically, <clears throat> there was a problem in Taiwan of people not wanting to donate their bodies to science. And so, Zi uh, had developed this way of, based on the Buddhist principles, which people donate their their bodies when they die, the cadavers, and are they're brought in and, and uh, treated in, in this tremendous kind of respect with all these ceremonies. And uh, this is actually not the, not the anatomy classroom, but this is a, a classroom where, where, the, where the medical students practice various kinds of surgery on, 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 on cadavers, uh, get ready for doing it on a real person. And uh, they have the, uh, on the wall, little biography of the uh, cadaver, the person they're working on, what their personal life was like and so forth and so on. Ne next slide. Uh, and then at the end of the process, when the medical students are, are finished with the, with, with the uh, you know, cadaver, it's uh, cremated, the medical students act as pallbearers and so forth. And um, half the ashes are given back to uh, given to the family. The other half are kept in this kind of chapel, which is next to the classroom where they do the anatomy class and so forth. And next slide. And uh, the uh, ashes are kept in these little kind of urns and so forth. And before, uh, you know, working on the cadavers, uh, the doctors and the medical students can go and they can meditate and they can pray and so forth uh, for the gratitude for the people who donated their you know, their bodies for this process and so forth. So it's a way of, it was their one, one way of kind of humanizing the practice of training of doctors and practice of medicine and so forth based on their kind of Buddhist principles, uh, which also then solved a very practical problem in Taiwan about people not being willing to donate their bodies to science. Now, now lots of people do and they have more cadavers than uh, they need, which and they give to other hospitals. Um, if they're promised to treat the bodies in this in this way, uh, next one, which is it? Oh, that's me. Okay, I, that, that's we can just end with that. I'm giving a talk to the nuns and Sinji there. You see, they're all sitting on the floor and so forth, and I was uh, telling them about civil society and religion. So uh, with that, uh, I've taken more of your time than I should. Please, you know, maybe you can ask any questions if you like. Professor Manton, that was fabulous. Really, really interesting. Um, I don't think you spoke about uh, the Uyghur Muslims. Um, what's their situation? I, I believe- Well, it's China... terrible. The situation yeah, is terrible. Yeah, I'm not very happy you know, with I, them, right? I gave a lecture on that to the Osher about that. Okay, it's awful. Okay, so uh, basically uh, <clears throat> practicing a kind of cultural genocide, trying to wipe out, you know, tra traces of their religion, right? And the Uyghurs, you know, the Uyghurs are, um, 
ethnically different from the, the Han Chinese, right? The Uyghurs basically are, are a, a Turkish, Turkic people, people, you know, the ancestors came um, starting a thousand years, over a thousand years ago from, from Turkey, from Turkestan. And so the language they speak is sort of like Turkish. Uh, the food they eat is sort of like Turkish uh, and so forth. They look Turkish. They don't, they don't look, you know, Chinese in the way that Han Chinese look. So, um, and most of them are Muslims. Okay, they're, they're about, oh, about 11, 12 million, I suppose. Most of them are Muslims, Sunni Muslims, mostly. And there's some other groups in that area. It's the western part of China. It's like the west here in the USA. It's mostly desert. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there have been some rebellions against uh, Chinese rule there. And the government's cracked down very hard on them. And so they can claim they're, you know, worried about terrorism and so forth. Uh, there have been some problems, but I think, you, you know, now they've gone after their religion, which they have an ethic problem for sure, uh, for various reasons. For one thing is the Han Chinese come in to this area and they could take in the best jobs and there's, there's oil there and, and the, the, the locals, the Uyghurs don't get good jobs in the oil fields, uh, you know, they've been exploited and all this kind of stuff they feel. So uh, there's an ethic problem. But then the Chinese felt that to get rid of the ethnic problem, they got to get rid of the religion. And so they can throw you in these sort of concentration camps, internment camps, if they catch you with uh, have a copy of the Koran in your house or uh, wanting to fast during Ramadan or something like that. And uh, and, and, and then in, in, in there, try to wipe out, you know, brainwash, if you want to use the term, your um, religious affiliations. So they're doing that. And it's a major, you know, global, terrible human rights abuse. It's awful. So that's, that's one way of dealing with religion. And especially religion they feel is connected to, um, you know, an ethic problem, uh, et cetera. Okay. Uh, besides the 11 million or so Muslims, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, there's another 11 million or so Muslims in China, the so-called Hui Chinese, which uh, for one thing, look Chinese. They basically, you know, you couldn't distinguish them by just looking at them. They, they don't eat pork and they, um, you, you know, uh, go to mosques and so forth. Uh, but, uh, they're very culturally assimilated. They speak Chinese and so forth. Uh, and they are kind of um, under suspicion, I suppose, but not as persecuted as much as the, as the, as the Muslims in, in, in Xinjiang. It's a bad thing. It, it's, it's a major violation of both religious freedom, but also ethics oppression and so forth. Sounds like we should have you back for a talk just on the Uyghurs. Uh, Stephen Adler, your question, followed by Christine. Thank you, Suzanne. Hey, Dick, thank you very much for that. Thank you. That was, that was terrific. Um, is there, um, to what degree is there any, uh, I don't know what the term would be, sort of, you know, intersectarian cooperation amongst different religions uh, in the face of governmental oppression or suppression? Uh, <clears throat> not much. You know, the Protestant and Catholics don't work together, at least not very much. Uh, overall, the government likes to keep it that way, right? And then within these different groups, there are uh, hostilities, right? So among the Catholics, the people, the underground ones and the others, there, there's some, it, it depends on different areas, but there can be some very nasty uh, conflicts between them. Uh, in some areas it's fine, but other areas not. In the Protestants, there are also conflicts between some of these house churches, etc. cetera. Uh, there are also, these kind of sectarian groups, cults, if the Chinese wants to call them, uh, which, you know, uh, splinter off and do things like, there's this one group called the Church of Almighty God, which actually has quite a few 
members these days. And uh, the government trying to wipe out, but they can't wipe out. Church of Almighty God uh, believes that Almighty God is actually a woman uh, who now lives in Queens in New York, right? <laughs> she's in exile. And uh, she's an incarnation of God, a female incarnation, because uh, in their belief system, you have to have yin and yang, you know, male, female principle. And uh, God the Father was the God of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Then there was God the Son, the New Testament. Now it's time for a woman who is this woman in now living in New York, but she um, produces all these writings. And then there's a guy, another guy with her named Zhao, who's like the St. Paul of this group that uh, organizes local churches and, and, and disseminates their teachings and so forth. And uh, uh, people who follow this group in China can get arrested, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all very complicated. Anyway, so that, that sectarian splits within, you know, within within Christianity. And then there are these groups, the, the so-called Falun Gong, of course, and these groups that were based on Buddhism and Taoism and so forth, which are also seen now as uh, heterodox religions as the official I think the real translation, the Chinese wants them to call it evil cults. But in any case, there are a, a bunch of groups like that now uh, still in China, which now have gone global and uh, you know have websites and propagate you know, the message globally. So there's it's 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 a you know <laughs> a very dynamic uh, situation, which is not from the point of view of the government fully under control. Thank you. Peter, followed by Ken. It was my turn, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Go ahead, Christine. I put it down because it was too insistent. And my question is actually in line with Stevens. But I was wondering if given the multiplicity of religion, big religions that coexist, is there any kind of theological serious debate, let's say at the university level or at a different religious level? that really talks about the fundamentals of religion rather than of the practicalities of religion. The, okay, so at the university, at the university level or at the seminary level, there's some of that. In, and, and there are you know, departments of religious studies now in uh, different universities, right? Uh, it's sort of like this. Um, within the Protestant community, right, there, there is this uh, sort of reconstructionist theology, which basically says that, uh, you know, God is everywhere. And even if you're an atheist, you're still be saved, believe in God, and so forth and so on. Then there are these more fundamentalist groups that say, no, you know, you know, you have to have faith in Jesus directly, and so forth and so on. And besides, uh, these communists are bad, et cetera, right? So you have these kind of splits within within the Protestant churches, right? Uh, you have um, different groups of Buddhists, again, uh, pushing either more kind of charismatic or more kind of, you know, conventional kind of, kind of approaches. You have that. The problem in, in China is that it's... Um, it, it, it's suppressed, so so it's very difficult to to have, you know, sophisticated kind of theological discussions. Okay, at least normative, right? Uh, in a place like Taiwan, it's different. The government under Chiang Kai-shek basically suppressed all sorts of religious groups. Buddhists couldn't have universities, etc. They let the Christians have one uh, because the Cold War and so forth, but others didn't. But now there's a bunch of them, Buddhist universities, Taoist universities, even, and, and, uh, and a whole intellectual life, which then kind of leads to fairly sophisticated, you know, uh, understandings of the different kinds of faiths. Uh, in China, not so possible, right? Uh, because they don't want, you know, sophisticated theologies uh, that would make things more complicated for them, right? It's not encouraged. Uh, but in any case, so uh, 
there's that kind of stuff going on. Peter, followed by Ken. Hey, Dick, this is a very interesting uh, talk. I'm really fascinated by it. I wonder if you could talk, um, you know, in the face of opposition and hostility by the government, the quite a, it's interesting that people take up these religions, different religions, and I wonder if you might give a, is there a social science interpretation of why the people take up religion in these conditions? I don't mean a theological interpretation, a, a, a social, people are interested in, in religious development around the world. Why are the Protestant religions spreading in Catholic communities in South America, for example, and other places? Is there a, a social science view about why these religions or particular religions are spreading in China? Why are the Catholics spreading here or the Protestant sects here or the Buddhists there? Is there a social science interpretation of that? Yeah, I suppose there are different kinds of levels of social science interpretation, okay? Look, I think one part is simple. Uh, you know, um, that the basic, you know, ideology, communist ideology doesn't give people, uh, you know, comfort and meaning when it comes to, you know, the ultimate things of life, right? So I, I have a friend, for example, who is, uh, you know, an elite communist, you know, whose father was a, a very high ranking general, the whole thing. But she tells me when he died, okay, her mother who has been with him, you know, for, for 50, 60 years or whatever, uh, went to temple went to the temple every day, right? You know, pray for him and so forth, right? So, you know, grief and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the standard, you know, way of thinking about it, you know, wasn't enough for people. And I think for a lot of people like that, older people, uh, I, I did another study of, uh, you know, in China of social workers actually, right? And uh, they were telling me, this one group of social workers dealt with elderly people, you know, in, in these elder homes and stuff. And they said, you know, uh, these people that they want to talk about uh, religion, spirituality. And my one informant said, you know, I'm an atheist, I'm a communist, you know, I, we, I, we don't believe in that. I, I think she, maybe she did, but she doesn't. And but said, you know, this really helps these people. They they need, to, you know, they need, you know, they're getting to that stage of life, and 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 they need this. So there are certain kind of things like that. I think that um, you know are perennial. In for different kind of religions, the, the Protestants par partly grow because you know they're not burdened by like a, you need an official priesthood and so forth. You can have all sorts of different kind of people you know, preaching the faith, it's more flexible, et cetera. Uh, the Protestant communities, some of these grew, at least one set of data has to in places interestingly where the old folk religion was sort of wiped clean during the cultural revolution, where temples were destroyed and so forth. It was kind of a vacuum. And then uh, Protestants came along and said, well, you know, you don't need this temple. You've got direct connection with the Holy Spirit, et cetera. You can, you know, it could all be good. Uh, women liked it, especially because the old temples were run by men, right? <laughs> in any case, and so you, you get these pockets growing in areas where the old folk religion was kind of wiped out, but people still feel a need for some sort of, you know, spiritual uh, connection, right? And, and then uh, other groups, uh, for example, uh, people looking for an alternative to the current system in China, even a democratic one, a certain number of them have been attracted to Christianity. So there are these so-called rights lawyers in China, you know, a lot of them have been put in jail now, right? Uh, uh, who have been advocating for, you know, human rights and so forth. And, you know, globally they're talked about. These rights lawyers, disproportionate number, maybe maybe 50% are Christians, okay? <laughs> and uh, and that it gives them, you know, strength to, to deal with, you know, what, they're, what they have to face, including getting put into prison and worse. And, uh, and maybe connections with the global, you know, community, right? And so, and I don't know the, you know, I'm not gonna give a definitive answer to this, but 
Christianity, you're talking about less than 10% of the whole population, even though you know it's a significant number. But when you have 50% of these rights lawyers, you know, there's something going on there, right? That's a classic Weberian question for you, Dick. Are they rights lawyers because they're Christians or are they Christians because they're rights lawyers? That's a question. I don't know. Faber couldn't figure it out. I can't figure it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Ken, your question? Ken, do you want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. I'm wondering what you think will ha look like, China will look like in five years. I also just sent out the name of a book that I finished reading that was on this whole Uyghur situation. But, you know, the country is going to become the number one economic power. Um, they clearly want to invade or control Taiwan and the South China Sea. Um, and when you read this book about the Uyghurs, it's obvious that they have developed all of this technology for face recognition and uh, uh, cloning of iPhones, et cetera, et cetera, which they can easily use on any part of their population that poses a threat to the uh, communist rule. So it's very frightening to me as an American. Um, where do you think it's going five years from now? Oh. Well, you know, look, we are, we have our 21st century China thing here and our various kinds of experts who think, okay, first of all, Taiwan, what my colleague, Timing Chung from the, you know, he's head of the ITCC here, he thinks now, um, given the demonstration of the Russian army's incompetence in Ukraine, uh, uh, for various reasons, that's going to inhibit the Chinese from trying to take over Taiwan for another number of years. Okay, so this is just geostrategic, you know, military stuff, right? So uh, I, I'm willing to follow him on that, right? Uh, I think the Chinese have been upset by basically, you know, Putin's incompetence. Okay, uh, now in terms of the surveillance, they're uh, you know, extremely extensive and sophisticated. Uh, as you said, in, in, in Xinjiang, they're rolling it out. Uh, it's rolled out to everywhere. You go to China, you know, uh, they have, uh, for one thing, they're, they're further advanced than we are in artificial intelligence. Uh, one reason being, of course, that to train, you know, machine learning, you know, face recognition, you need many, many, you know, images of people, right? We have problems, there's issues of privacy, you can't do it. China, no problem, <laughs> they have all sorts of surveillance stuff, they can run this through, uh, you know, the AI and uh, get it to be really good, at, pretty good at facial recognition, although it's not infallible by any means, okay? So you have that, you have ways of keeping track of people, you know, through the, your cell phones and everything else. So. It, it's a surveillance state and, and it's, it's quite extensive. They have sophisticated technology. Uh, and it keeps people under control. Yet, I, I still think, I mean, that's part of the moral, if there is one of some, you know, what I was saying, you know, in the lecture, is that in spite of all that, people find ways of kind of, you know, getting around it and there are creative ways to work around, right? So it's not, there's a, we, from the outside, you see the integument, you know, the, the hard shell, uh, but inside there are all sorts of ways that people subtly communicate and so forth with each other. Now, how, how that's gonna work out, you know, uh, in the long run, I don't know. I mean, you know, for one thing, their attempt at control has, you know, has recently back, backfired in Shanghai, you know, it, it, an incredible way of trying to control the whole population and so forth is, is producing all sorts of resistance, really bad feelings. And uh, how ultimately successful that's going to be is up for grabs. I don't know. Okay. 
So there are all these contingencies. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't predict the future. You know, uh, you, you get, you get the pandemic, you get to get all this other stuff going on. Um, but China's, you know, is getting more powerful. There's no question about it. It's an issue. I think, you know, uh, uh, I've written about this in other contexts too. You know, it, it needs to be, uh, you know, confronted. Uh, there are still areas where we have communication and, you know, and cooperation. I think those you've got to maintain and so forth and so on. Uh, but it's, it, 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 it's a challenge, okay? Um, I'm not going to predict, um, you know, uh, five years. Here's a novel, if you're interested, by, by this Admiral uh, uh, Stravinus, uh, who used to be, he was Admiral here, he's commander of, uh, uh, of NATO too, and uh, then worked in the White House under, I think, President Bush. So he, he's a very well-connected guy and, he, and he's, con he's been at our forums and so forth for China studies. And he, um, uh, he, he written a novel with this other guy. It's kind of like a thriller. It's called 2034. And the basic uh, plot is 2034, there's an encounter like a carrier group in the South China Sea. It sets in motion escalation. Anyway, the whole process goes on. He knows a lot about naval operations, obviously, and how escalations happen. In the end, they nuke San Diego. Okay. And I think he lived in San Diego, so he has a pretty good description of the city. He knows, he knows what he's talking about, San Diego. He knows about geopolitics, too. So nuclear war, they take over Taiwan. And anyway, uh, we nuke Shanghai. Anyway, that's the plot. So um, that's a bad scenario. But there are people, you know, in Washington who think along these lines, right? The possibilities of deadly escalation happening and so forth, which we certainly hope, you know, can be avoided, right? Uh, so anyway, so it's a dangerous world. It's, it's a ch the China thing is a challenge, you know. Um, uh, that's yeah. It. Professor Madsen, this has been fabulous. We really can't thank you enough. Um, your knowledge and expertise, it's just really given us a peek inside all the many complexities. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for the book recommendation too. Um, I'm sure both the RA and EA book clubs will be interested in taking a look at that. Uh, so we very much appreciate your talk today and uh, we'll certainly be inviting you back. Thank you so very much. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.